in simple ways yes. and that you open the eyes of those who are just being fooled in all levels of government and even in our own hearts and our own local people we thank you for the love you've given us and the message you've given for us to learn this day be it this day open our ears so we hear this message and be it this as we do our Bible studies in Jesus name we pray Amen, amen. amen. and Amen alright well, let's, let's continue to sing here we go
Okay, do me a favor, take your Bibles, get your sermon notes ready and your pen and pencil, but take your Bibles, hold them up, just your pledge to the Bible. Ready? Here we go. I believe. I believe that my Bible, that my Bible is the Word of God. Is the Word, Word of God. God. I will love it. I will love it. I will learn it. I will learn it. And I will live it. And I will live it to the glory of God. To the glory of God. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's our commitment to the Word of God. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the teachings of your Word. And we pray, Father, that as we open your Word now, Lord, uh, that you would just encourage our hearts and help us to see a deeper truth here, Father. And Lord, that, that you would just open our minds and all that we are to the deeper truths that you have for us. But Father, uh, we bind Satan, we bind his efforts to distract and to, to keep us from understanding the deeper thoughts. And Father, we just pray that, that uh, Satan would be down from this place and from our lives. But we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this time for it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say. Amen. 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 The name of the woman is Birdie Adams. Bertie Adams, and uh, Bertie died at the age of 71 in Palm Beach, Florida on Christmas Day, 1976. And according to the coroner's report, Bertie's cause of death was malnutrition. Um, she lived in a rundown shack and she was living in squalor and she was always going through the neighborhood begging for food and things like that. She was just kind of a nutty person. And, and so when she died, it was indeed because of a lack of nu nutritious food because all she ever ate was just junk food, just junk food. And, and as they went through her house trying to find out how to identify her and so forth, they came across two keys. And the keys were actually for two lock boxes in two different banks. Bank number one had 700 shares of AT&T. And back then in 1976, that was worth a lot of money, worth a lot of money back then. And in addition to the shares of AT&T, there was also $200,000 in cash. That was in the first bank. In the second bank, in the second lockbox, there were no shares of stock. It was just $700,000 in cash. Um, the only living relatives of Bertie was a niece and a nephew who ended up inheriting all of it. They inherited everything. And can you imagine them getting that phone call? You know, just saying, hey, we just want you to know that, that your Aunt Bertie died. Yet, you know, Bertie, you know, the one that you never wanted to attend any of your events because she, she never showered and... And she was just a bit of a nut and, and a bit of a kook. And remember that one? And well, well, she just left you two over a million dollars to divide between the two of you. Now, the person who told that story likes to point out that um, that misers are very weird people, but they sure make great ancestors. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I think that might be true. But but in the eighth chapter of Romans, it's as if God says, "Look, I'm giving you the keys to the lock boxes." And you need to unlock them right now to see what your inheritance is. So that when you begin to think that you're living in poverty, you're going to begin to recognize that you aren't. And you don't. And you won't. What you can do is to simply open the text of Scripture, and you can see what I've done for you, and see what I'm still going to do for you, not only now, but in the near future. And so today we're continuing on in our series of messages in Romans chapter 8. I'm calling what God has done to call you his own. And as you remember from last week, Romans chapter 8 begins with these very famous words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and if you missed that message, just go back and listen to it. You'll, you'll find it online. But the chapter begins with no condemnation. Chapter 8 begins with no condemnation. And that takes care of our past. And then the chapter ends, chapter 8 ends with no separation, which really takes care of our future. And yet what an ocean of truth lies between those two concepts. No condemnation, no separation, and just wonderful truth in between. And one of the things we're going to discover today is that salvation really is much, much more than God just taking away our sins. Uh, if you ask the average person what makes a Christian a Christian, they would probably say something like, well, they're a Christian because they're a person who's had their sins forgiven. They didn't forgive their sins, so that's what makes them a Christian. Well, yeah, our sins are forgiven, but that forgiveness just happens to bring about something else. Something else happens, and it triggers a whole bunch of other things that's going to occur as a result of our salvation, of our forgiveness, of our sin. So you're not just forgiven when you're saved. That unlocks the door for a whole lot more to occur. In fact, the whole Trinity is involved in your salvation. Not just Jesus, the whole Trinity. 
I mean, that's how huge this thing called salvation is. It's a huge deal for God to get you out of the pit of sin and out of the pit of self-centeredness and to get you saved. It is a very big deal to God. So let's pick up the study where we left off last week. It's the first passage on your outline there. It's Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 18. And here's what Paul says. He says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Oh, I like that. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is yet to be revealed. Uh, to us. Amen. Wow. Okay. And all God's people said. Amen. 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 <laughs> Here's the first key question on your outline there. If, if salvation is such a big and huge deal that it requires all that God is, then the question is, how is the Trinity involved in it? How does the Trinity get involved in our salvation? Well, that leads us to point number one. And first of all, I want you to see this, that the Holy Spirit leads us. So just write that in there. Let's take a look at how each person of the Godhead contributes to our salvation. The Holy Spirit leads us. Look at the next verse again, Romans 8, 14. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So that's one of the ways that you know that you're truly a son or daughter of God is if you experience the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. That assures you. That, 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 that builds confidence in your life that you, you really are God's. You belong to God. The Holy Spirit's there leading and guiding you. So that brings up the next question. Well, where then, then does the Holy Spirit lead us, and what does he lead us to do? So if he leads us, then where does he lead us, and what does he lead us to do? Well, here's letter A on your outline. Now, first of all, he leads us in our struggle with sin. That's what, I mean, that, 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 that's one of the ways of knowing that the Holy Spirit's working in your life. He leads us in the struggle with our sin. Again, look at the next passage, Romans 8, 13, the next verse on your outline. It says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, he's talking about sinful deeds there, then you're going to live. Now, that's an amazing statement, to put to death the sinful uh, deeds of the body. You know, the King James translation used to say to mortify the deeds of the body, to mortify them. Uh, we don't use that word mortify much anymore. Uh, mortification anymore, except for maybe mortician. We talk about the morticians and stuff, but, but we don't use the word mortify anymore, but it means to put to death uh, sin in our lives. Put that to death. The ancients used to say, either you will kill sin, or sin will kill you. One or the other. And the Christian fights against sin, at least trying with the help of the Holy Spirit, obviously, to kill it. That's what the Christian tries to do, is to kill the Holy Spirit. However, most Christians today Say, I don't want to kill it, I just want to manage it. Isn't that true? Yeah. Isn't that true? That's what most that's the attitude of most Christians. I don't want to kill it. I just want to manage it. <coughs> but the Bible says that that through the Holy Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body that we may live. Now, this is really wor worthy of a separate message, but, but let me just simply say that the way that we put to death the deeds of the flesh, the way you do that is through real deep repentance. That's how it starts. But that requires trust in God and faith in God and, and, uh, and, and by gathering together with God's people, by reading God's word consistently, and, and sometimes then by even taking drastic action. Sometimes we just have to do that. I mean, one time Jesus was talking about the battle with lust that we, we deal with, and, and, and he said this. He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is better, you, you, that you, you, uh, for it's better for you to enter into heaven with one eye than to be in hell with two. So he said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Well, that, that's pretty drastic. But what Jesus was saying was, whatever you need to do to put to death the lust of the flesh, he's saying, then do it. Do it. So the Holy Spirit leads us in helping us with our struggle with sin as he leads us to put to death the sinful deeds of the flesh. Now you might ask, well, and, and remember what we talked about. When we talked about the flesh, remember what we said Paul was talking about? There? He's talking about our sinful nature, right? It's that propensity to sin. 
He's not talking about really the destruction of our flesh, but he's talking about the propensity to sin, killing that, destroying that propensity, getting rid of it. You might ask, well, is Paul talking about to Christians or non-Christians here? Well, in, in the previous uh, verses, uh, it does contrast and bring a contrast between the converted and the unconverted. But in this case, Paul's talking to Christians here as a warning. Look at the next passage on your outline there, Romans 8, 12, and 13. He says, so then, brothers, so he identifies us, right? He says, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. In a sense, this verse applies to both Christians and non-Christians alike. I mean, if you've never trusted Christ, if you're not a Christian uh, and you're living according to the flesh, you know, then you're, you're following your own dictates, your own desires, your own agenda. Your own sinful lifestyle is ultimately going to end up killing you in all kinds of ways. Death occurs in all kinds of ways. And, uh, and so uh, and, and you'll die in this life in many different ways, in the sense of emptiness in your life. And, and eventually you're, there's going to be eternal separation from God, so it's eternal death there as well. However, if, if you're a Christian and you live according to the flesh, you're also going to die, at least in the sense that life will not only be empty of anything good, but it's also going to be filled with rot. And there's always going to be all kinds of conviction, all kinds of guilt, all kinds of things that follow you as a result of that, if you're a Christian trying to live according to the flesh. So if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. That's what the, Holy, that, that's what the Scripture says. So the Holy Spirit leads, <coughs> helps lead us in our struggle with sin, but that's not all. Here's letter B. He also leads us in our struggle with assurance. He also leads us in our struggle with assurance. The question of do we belong to God or do we not belong to God? You know, Can I be saved and then not saved? Can I, can I be saved and then not saved? And, and look at the next passage, Romans 8, 14 through 16. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are, what? Sons, Sons of God. God. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you are a son of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. In other words, you don't have to be afraid of this. You don't have to be afraid of hell anymore. You don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid of the grave anymore. You don't, have to, you, you don't receive a spirit of, uh, uh, of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, Paul points that out for a very specific reason. Uh, the spirit himself, he says, bear, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our, our spirit that we're children of God, so therefore we cry out, Abba, Father, right? Amen. And what the Holy Spirit does is give us not only the permission, but the desire now to call God <coughs> our Father. To even call him Papa or Daddy. Abba uh, is Aramaic for Daddy. It's what a, a, a small child might say to their parent, to their dad when they're growing up. I mean, when our children were small, we, they'd call us daddy or, or dada or whatever like that. But but uh, in Aramaic, it's Abba or daddy in, in, in translation. And so we can call God that because the Holy Spirit allows us to speak that way. I mean, if you've ever led a person to Jesus Christ, then you know almost immediately after their conversion, you almost, you almost know immediately that it was the real deal. Because almost immediately, they, when they start to pray, they end up calling God, just naturally as anything, their Father. They end up calling on God as their Father. And, and when they pray, they call God Father, and they do it because they've been inspired and led and even spoken through by the Holy Spirit. He's given them that indication, that understanding that now he, he's your Father. He's not just a Father, he's your Father. You know, in almost every instance where I've heard someone who is going through a tough time and they're praying, almost every time they're going to start their prayer by saying, Father, you know, Heavenly Father, 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 please help me. Father, please hear my cries. But isn't it interesting that our spiritual impulse is to call God our Father? And we can even say Daddy. Now, during our opening prayer, if if I would have prayed or Brian would have prayed, you know, now, Daddy, we're all here together as a congregation, and Dad, we need your assistance, and Dad, we need your input here. And, and uh, I, I can imagine some folks might think that was a little weird or you know, a little, maybe a little disrespectful, but because I, I would address, I, 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 you know, because we would address God with that, in that sense. But I could have done that. Brian could have done that. Anybody could have really done that. And, and especially in your private prayer life, 
If you want to do that, that's a great time to do it. I mean, if you want to look in the eyes of the Father by faith, so to speak, <coughs> and, and say, Abba, Daddy, you know, then the Holy Spirit says it's okay to do that. That's a good thing to do. It's recognition of the fact that we're that intimate with him, we're that close to him. You know, in Old Testament days, whenever the Jews would copy the Old Testament, whenever they would copy it down, they were so concerned about reverence for the name of God that whenever they would write one of his names, particularly the name Jehovah, they would stop and they would clean out their pens and they put clean ink into it and they would wash their hands and then they would continue. They would make sure that everything was, was sparkling clean before they even wrote the name Jehovah. Now, now that uh, that has an upside because it, if it, uh, it, it, it truly is a wonderful thing to be reverent in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. It, it's a wonderful thing there. But it also has a downside because God became so distant to them as a result and he seemed so impersonal that in the Old Testament, they would never have thought of calling God Father. He's only mentioned as Father a few times in the Old Testament, but not by those who would call on him as Father. He's identified as Father, but not those who would call on him as Father. And even to this day, uh, the Muslim community, they, they cannot call Allah Father. They, they're not allowed to do that. But Abba and Father, and the desire to call God our Father, is the witness of the Holy Spirit and it came into being after the Holy Spirit came um, in the New Testament there after Jesus' ascension and, and, uh, and when the Holy Spirit came then there was this desire to identify God as a Father there was this, and Jesus did that all the time our Father remember he taught us to pray how? our Father who art in heaven so we can say to God I love you Father I love you Dad so the Holy Spirit leads us in our struggle with sin he leads us in our struggle with assurance and, 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 and having that freedom and having that desire to call on God as our Father, I think, helps assure us of the fact that we are saved. But then let us see, he leads us in our struggle with our identity. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit leads us in our struggle with our identity. He leads us to understand that we truly are now children of God. We are. Look at the next passage, Romans 8, 16. It says, the Spirit, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now listen, other religions around the world, all religions, they all think that they're right. They are just as convinced that they're right as we are that we are right, as Christians are right. But the primary difference is they don't have the assurance that we have. They just don't have it. I mean, if you ask any one of them, irregardless of the religion, if you ask any one of them, do you know that you belong to God and that you belong to him forever and that God is your father and so you're going to get to be with him forever, no question about it? Do you have that assurance? And if they're being honest with you, they're going to say no. And they'll say, and they'll, they'll follow it up probably like this, no one can have that kind of assurance. No one can have that. But we can. And we do. And I think that's one of the primary things that sets us apart from every other religion of the world. Because it's only given to us, that assurance is only given to us by the presence and reality of the living Holy Spirit in us. God's presence in each of our hearts. The Holy Spirit gives us a sense of cleansing from our sin. But he also gives us a sense of assurance that I'm a child of God, I belong to God, and that's never going to change. I have a new identity. I'm no longer a child of Adam. I am instead now a child of God. A while back, I was, I was, when I was still living in Tucson, um, I was parked at a light waiting for a bunch of bicyclists to go by. You know, it, was, it was one of those um, bicycle races that we had there in Tucson, and, uh, and I had to wait as about 300 bicycles went by. And in Tucson, you, you had to do, I mean, it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Yeah, El Tour de Tucson. What? El Tour de Tucson. Yeah, El Tour de Tucson. Yeah. And, and, and so you just have to wait. And, and so I had to wait as 300. And there could be gaps and stuff that they'll, they don't care. They're going to keep you waiting until they all get done. And, uh, and so there were, there were like 300 bikes that were going by. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm just watching them all and just trying to buy my time a little bit. And, and I noticed one guy, though, who sort of stood out because he had a T-shirt on that was different from everybody else's. And the T-shirt said on the back and on the front, it said, For My Father. And it was in big letters, it said, For My Father. And I thought to myself, probably his father has passed on, and very likely what he was saying was, I'm doing this for my dad. I I'm doing this for my hoping that his dad was somehow watching him, you know, from heaven, and, and saying, this is for my father. And I thought about all the 
training that this man went through to ride in this competition, all the hardship involved in, in order to ride in this, this long marathon and the sacrifice he was making to be there and to do that. And, 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 and so and it just got me to thinking, what is it in our lives that we can say, this is for my father? You know, what sin do you have to put away? What discipline of life do you have to develop? What sacrifice are you willing to make? What are you willing to do or train to do so that you can say, this is for my father? I'm doing this for Abba. I'm doing this for my dad. Because my Heavenly Father loves me so much and cares so much for me and has done so much for me. This is for my Father. And I can guarantee you that our Heavenly Father is watching. Amen? He is watching. So how's the Trinity involved? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit leads us. Secondly, number two on your outline, the Heavenly Father then adopts us. The Heavenly Father adopts us. Look at the next verse on your outline in Romans 8.15. It says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Father says, you're mine. You belong to me now. Now you'll notice that in this passage, there's two different expressions used to describe us. One is that we are the children of God. The second one is that we are the sons of God. That's, that's how we're described. Children of God, sons of God, sons and daughters of God. And, and so we hear about adoption now. Let me clarify all that. First of all, we get into the Christian life by being born again into it, right? Amen. Being born into it is what makes you a child of God. The Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So being you're born into the family of God uh, by new birth. Uh, so we get into the Christian life by being born into it. And as soon as we're born into it, God then adopts us at the very same time. When we're born into the family, we're also adopted at the very same moment. And the reason he does that, and Paul argues this in Galatians, the reason that he does that is that a baby can't enter into his inheritance until he becomes an adult. And so God doesn't wait for, want to wait for that. I mean, if you had a child, that child could inherit a million dollars, but he can't enjoy it or utilize it because he's still just a child, right? Can't do anything with it, really. I mean, he just sits there. Now, you need to be an adult, son or daughter, in order to enjoy your inheritance. So this is what the Bible teaches. That it teaches that we're born again, and at that moment of the new birth in Christ, we're placed into the family of God, and immediately, at that same moment, God, at a time, God adopts us so that we can enter into our inheritance right away. And I, I think also this has to do with the fact that we're not Jewish, and so we have to, in a sense, be adopted, in, in, in a sense, as Gentiles into the family of God, into that family as well. But so the new Christian who has never trusted Christ before, who now trusts in a Savior, has the very same inheritance as the believer who has lived with God and known God for many, many years. In fact, we have the same inheritance that the Apostle Paul does. Amen. We have the exact same inheritance because we're all adopted. Now that new believer is going to have to grow in their understanding of that inheritance, but it's his possession just as much as it is anybody else's. I'm still learning about our inheritance. I've been a Christian for many, many years now, but I'm still learning about the inheritance that is ours. I'm still discovering it. I'm still figuring it out. There's no doubt in my mind that when the Apostle Paul talks about God adopting us, he's undoubted, undoubtedly or speaking about the Roman method of adoption because Paul was identifying that and, and connecting with elements around that people could connect with. He's talking about the Roman method of adoption. And the Roman method of adoption was very complicated, but it involved two very important ingredients. In fact, here's the next key thought on your outline there. In the Roman culture, adoption involved at least two very important elements. Letter A, first of all, all ties to previous parents had to be severed. That's one of the elements of it involved in, in Roman adoption. All ties to previous parents had to be severed. Now that meant that all forms of communication were broken. All fellowship was completely broken. All debts were canceled. It meant that all obligations of every kind to the previous family were negated. They no longer existed. There was a complete breaking from the old as you entered into the new. That's why Paul says, so we are obligated now as God's children to no longer live according to the flesh. We're no longer obligated to do that. See, when God adopts us into his family, we no longer have any obligation at all to obey the impact that Adam and the world had in our lives because that was our former family. We were a part of Adam's family, right? 
but now we've been adopted into God's family, <coughs> and so there has to be a severing, there has to be a breaking of all of that. When God adopts us into his family, we're no longer under any obligation to the impact of Adam and the, and the world. I, our allegiance now is to our new family. Our sin debt has been canceled, and we are to break all ties and fellowship with the things of the world. I, I mean, that's why the Bible says that we are to be in the world, but not what? Of the world. In it, but not of it. And that's because we've been adopted into God's family. We are in another sphere of existence now. So the very first thing adoption did was to sever you from your old parents, your old way of life. The second element had to do with a bonding that needed to occur between a new father and his new child. And so here's letter B. A new bonding had to occur, which meant that you were given a new name and a new status. You were given a new name, a new status that was secure until the death of the father. Until the death of who? The father. The father. So you were secure in that name and you were secure in that status until the death of the father. Now to be adopted meant that you were given your father's name. Now listen, we are called Christians, which literally means little Christs. Christian means little Christ. And you were given a new status, which meant that you not only represented the father, that particular father, and that family now, but you would also inherit all the blessings of that father. You represented him, but you also inherit everything. And you'd also have a new sense of security because all the wealth of the father would now be shared. And that adopted son or daughter, because of that very solemn ceremony, would now belong to the father forever until that father died. And of course, our heavenly father is never going to die. And so we are eternally secure all the way to heaven. Amen? Mm -hmm. We had that security all the way to heaven. So what Paul is talking about here is that when God adopts us, he accepts us as sons and daughters and we belong to him with all the rights and privileges with all the joys and happiness that are associated with that privilege and with that honor we are his we're no longer a part of the rest of the world we're his in fact here's the next key thought on your outline here as adopted children of god we receive the father's name i just want you to write this in there we receive his name we receive the father's friendship we receive his name we receive his friendship we receive the father's wealth we receive the Father's wealth, and we receive the Father's sense of security. We receive his name, his friendship, his wealth, and his security. We get all of that. His name, his wealth, and security. Uh, listen, we really do inherit everything that God has. And I'm not making this up. In fact, I'm going to give you some verses in a moment that, that shows that this is true. But, but look at this next verse, Revelation 21.3. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Wow. God himself will what? Be with them and be their God. You know, uh, we know a little bit about what, here on earth, what that's like. We know a little bit about that. Because... We, we have that relationship with God the Father now, right? So we know a little bit about that, but oftentimes that relationship gets a little bit clouded and a little bit unclear, mostly because of sin and what sin does and when we sin and when we blow it. It kind of muddles that relationship. But, but just imagine the total clarity, the complete clarity of our conscience and, 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 and our hearts that have, been, that have been completely purified by God. And then to be in His presence fully capable of enjoying, of enjoying everything about the Heavenly Father. I mean, I, one day we get all of that and so much more, all because the Heavenly Father has adopted us. So how is the Trinity involved? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit leads us, the Heavenly Father adopts us, and then number three on your outline there, I just want to point out that the, the Son crowns us. And this is the part that's just hard to believe, but the Son crowns us. Look at the next passage again, Romans 8, 15 through 17, chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with who? Christ. With Christ, provided... We suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified or crowned with him. 
when it says that we are heirs of God, what that means <clears throat> is that, as I've already emphasized, that, that could mean that we get to own everything that God owns. We get to own everything. But, you, in fact, you might remember the story of the prodigal son and, and the boy who stayed home. Remember, the, prodigal, the story of the prodigal son, we think it's about the prodigal, but it's really about the boy who stayed home. That's really what that story is about. And, uh, and, and you might remember how angry that boy who stayed home was when the prodigal son was accepted back by the father and he came back after squandering his inheritance. He, he, he squandered his inheritance. And, and so welcoming the boy back, the father threw a party and had an animal uh, killed, uh, slaughtered an animal. So, so, uh, and and, and, and uh, the boy, the, the other son, became really angry about that. You remember that he became angry because he didn't have an animal to slaughter at his party like his returning brother did. And, and, and remember what the father said to him? The father said to him, and he said, son, why are you thinking that way? Don't you already realize that all I have is already yours? It already belongs to you. You're upset because you don't have a calf to have a party with? Are you kidding me? Look at all those cows out there. They're already yours. They already belong to you. Enjoy them. Just enjoy them. And by the way, that's a picture of us. Because all too often, we tend to throw up to God prayers like, God, would you bless this? And God, would you bless this? And God, why can't I be blessed like that? And God, why can't I get this kind of blessing? And God, why can't I have this blessing over here? And, and God says, what are you talking about? Can't you see all the blessings I've already given you? They're all yours. Just enjoy them. Just enjoy them. You know, the truth is, our prayers probably ought to be sprinkled with a whole lot more thanksgiving and a whole lot more praise and faith than just simply asking, asking, asking all the time. Now, I'm not saying it's not wrong to ask, I, I, or it's wrong to ask. I think we should ask. We need to ask God for things. We certainly should do that. But let's also make sure that we're giving lots of praise and thanksgiving for the good things that we've already got. Amen? That we're recognizing all the wonderful blessings he's already given us. In fact, here's the next key thought on your outline there. The question is, what does it mean to be an heir of God? Well, it means that we get, first of all, we get to receive all that God has. That's really what it means. It means we get to receive all that God has. But it gets even better than that. Are you ready for this? To be an heir of God in the Greek text could also mean this. It means that we not only get all that God has, but it also means that we get to receive God himself. Let's write that in there. It means we get to receive God himself. We inherit God himself. Heirs, we are heirs of God. We get God. Heirs Amen. of God. We get God. I don't think we have to choose between those two interpretations there because scripturally both of these things are true. We get all that God has, but we also get God. In fact, look at the next verse, Romans, uh, or rather Psalm 16.5. It says this, it says, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. The, what's the portion of my inheritance? The Lord. the Lord. The Lord himself is the portion of my inheritance. I need God. Look at the next passage, Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. It says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but my God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He's my inheritance forever. You read the Psalms and you discover that God himself is our portion. Not just everything he owns, everything he created, but God himself. We get him. You know what's interesting is that when you have to share an inheritance with someone, you have to split it up, right? If you get an inheritance and, and it's shared with somebody else, you have to split it up. But now listen, I believe that when it comes to our, our spiritual inheritance, we don't ever have to split it up. We don't have to split it up. I mean, you get all of heaven, you get all of God. And all the other believers who have trusted in Christ, they also get all of heaven. And they also get all of God. We get all of heaven. Each of us gets all of heaven. Each of us gets all of God. Amen. See, how can that happen? God's God. Amen. What do you mean, how can it happen? God's God. You don't have to just get one one hundredth of a million of heaven. You know, I mean... You get to get the whole thing. Isn't that wonderful? I think it's incredible. And so the Bible says that the Son crowns us because of our inheritance. Now, Paul points out that we become heirs of God, but we also become fellow heirs or joint heirs with Christ Jesus. So that means we get to receive Christ's name. Just write that in there. We get to receive Christ's name. We get to receive Christ's name. 
That's also part of our inheritance. We get his name. Now, I want you to visualize, if you can, that Jesus is opening up the last will and testament of the universe. He's about to read the last will and testament of the entire universe. He's opening it up. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it says that he's the only one who can open this book because it, it, it's really the whole history and the testament of the universe. And, but he opens it, and your name appears there. You know, the Bible says that there is a book of life and that your name, if you're a believer in Christ, was in it from before the very foundation of the world. Your name was already in it. And so there's your name, and right next to your name is Jesus' name. Because my name is Robert Douglas Donovan Christian. Amen. That's my name. Robert Douglas Donovan Christian. Cynthia Lee Donovan Christian. Christian Michael Mingo Christian. <laughs> So your name's right there next to Jesus. And, and then Jesus says, not only do you get heaven, and not only do you get all of God, and you get my name, but then he says you get to sit on my throne as well. You get to sit right there on my throne. And you might say, come on, Pastor, you're making this stuff up. No, I'm not. Thanks for the vote of confidence. But <laughs> to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ means that I also get to receive his throne. Just write that in there. I also get to receive his throne. Now look at this next passage on your outline here, Revelation 3.21. It says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. There it is. That's what he says. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and then sat down with my father in his throne. So Jesus overcame sit down with his father in his throne. He says, we're going to get to do that. If you're following, it means that we get to sit on the throne of God. And if you aren't blessed by that, and at the same time incredibly humbled by that, then I think we just need to get saved. Amen? I mean, because the very thought of that is just overwhelming to those of us who truly love God. It's just overwhelming. It's an idea that's overwhelming. Uh, Jesus said, to him who overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? you got to overcome. The truth is, I've never met a Christian who didn't want to be an overcomer. I've never met a Christian who didn't want to be an overcomer. But I have met tons of Christians who want absolutely nothing to overcome. Right? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's true. I've met all kinds of Christians who don't want to be, I mean, they want to be overcomers, but i met lots of them who want nothing to overcome. In fact, the minute God gives them something to overcome, they complain about it. And they keep saying, God, get it out of the way. Take this thing out of the way. Get it out of the way, God. And God says, don't you want to be an overcomer? I I'm going to give you a chance here. I'm going to give you a thorn in the flesh. I'm going to give you a difficult, difficult problem to, to, because I want you to be an overcomer. And we want to say, oh, God, please, I, I want to sit on the throne, but there's got to be an easier way to, for me to get there than this. And if the Bible is clear, to be an overcomer, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to face something in your life that you're going to have to overcome. And with God's help, you will, because the throne is part of your inheritance, but it does require a price tag. That's what Revelation said. As Jesus overcame, as you overcome. So to be a joint heir with Christ Jesus means that you get Christ's name, you get his throne, and, and here's the next one. I hope you're ready for this. We also get to receive his glory. We also get to receive his glory. Now folks, all of this is part of our inheritance. All of this. We get to receive his glory. Now, it's hinted at in Romans 8, 17. That's the next verse on your outline there. It's kind of hinted at here. Look at it again. It says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be what? Glorified, Glorified with him. Now, the assumption made here is that if you really do walk with God, then you're going to suffer. You're going to have some things to overcome. And God wants you to overcome them. But like Christ, in the end, you're going to be glorified. There's glory coming. In fact, look at, look at what Jesus said in this next verse, John 17, 22. Jesus himself prayed, the glory that, that you have given me, he's talking, this was his prayer for the saints, right? He said, the glory you have given me, I have given to who? To, to them. them. To us. That's to his followers, to you and I. Now, someone might say, well, if that's the case, 
then the New Agers must be right that we really are gods then because we get glorified. So we really are gods. No, nothing could be more heretical or more untrue or more unrealistic or just plain stupid than to believe that you're a god or could ever be a god. Amen? Amen. Amen? I mean, that's just dumb. That's just dumb. See, you have to get a correct view of God, a correct concept of God. See, God takes absolute delight in taking people who give him evil and he's found a way to take people who give him evil and to do good with that and to do them good and to, to do good to them and it's called grace God's grace and God loves to take people from the pit and say come with me to the powers and God loves to take people out of the mud and say come walk with me on marble and God loves to, to do that and that's called grace God's riches at Christ's expense God's grace now, sometimes there are people he can't do it for because they're so self-absorbed, thinking that they have to earn it or thinking that they're fine just the way that they are, and so in, in the process they shut God out. But God's absolutely desirous of pouring his grace out upon anyone who will but receive it. All we have to do is receive it. Amen. He wants us to have it. And God's amazing grace is what will fuel our worship him for all eternity. His amazing grace. And if you're doing the math, I mean, that's a very long time, amen? amen? Eternity's a long time to worship him, but God's grace is that amazing. So Jesus then makes us heirs of God, joint heirs of Jesus. And that's what happens when we get saved. The whole trinity is involved, and that inheritance, it's incredible. It's more than we can imagine. And we could study more on the inheritance. Amen. I mean, there's a lot more. I'm still discovering all the things in the Bible that are part of our inheritance. And you know what? Some of it is meant for us to claim today. Some of it, God intends for us to have it right now. That's why we're adopted, so that we can experience it right now. We just have to learn what those promises and those blessings are and then claim them. Well, let me finish today with some just some closing observations there on your outline. First of all, number one, I, I just want you to know that God forgives us to honor us. Please just understand that, that God forgives us to honor us. Don't ever think, well, I come to Jesus, I get my sins forgiven, I get a little help along the way, and basically it's all over with. You, you know, you, you, you know kind of like the idea of, you know, I made my commitment, and, and I made my decision for Jesus Christ, so that's all there is to it. No, 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 no. Listen, you come to Jesus to get your sins forgiven so that the books can be legally cleared so that God can begin to do then a good work in you and to honor you. But it's not as if he wants to honor you as having an identity all your own and saying, oh, you're just so special. You'd be so special. You know, that's not what, no, no. He, he's really honoring himself by showing undisputed grace to people who don't deserve it. So he's honoring you by honoring himself in you. Does that make sense? Amen. And, and, and that honors you. And so God says, okay, I'm going to choose some really rotten people to save. I'm going to choose some really bad people to save. I mean, he chose you. <laughs> right? Yeah. And he chose me. I, I, I mean, if the truth were really revealed, we'd find out some things about each other that would probably surprise a lot of us. Right? I mean, we, we would all be surprised about each other and about some of those things. But he, he's... he's taken some nasty things out of our lives. He's, done, he's taken some bad people and, and God says, these are the kinds of people I'm looking for. I'll take somebody like that. I'll forgive them. I'll remake them. I'll give them a new life and a new purpose and I'll make them trophies of my grace and in doing so, God honors us. He honors us. But God's intentions are not just to leave you after your sins are forgiven. God's intentions are that you would grow into Christ's likeness in order to bring many other sons and daughters into glory. And in the process of doing that, God will use all kinds of tools and disciplines that are needed in our lives. He'll use all kinds of resources, including his church and other Christians, to get you and I to the place that God wants us to be as his children, as his adopted sons and daughters. He wants us to get to that place. That's what he's really all about. We are specifically born for this specific time. Amen. And God has saved us and adopted us into his family for this time in history. For this period of time. And you have an impact right now that only you can have. And that's why he saved you. That's why he's delivered you. 
you are his trophy of grace for a purpose, for a reason. I mean, so so don't ever think that he, you know, oh, that person's just a Christian, he's just forgiven. No, it's much more than that. Have you ever seen the bumper sticker that says, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven? Have you ever seen that? I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. Well, thank God for that. Thank God that you're forgiven. But if that's all you are, then that, i got to tell you, that's not very much. If all you are as a Christian is just forgiven, that's not much. Uh, because there's so much more to your salvation than just forgiveness. Amen. I mean, it's incredible. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's huge. It's incredible. But there's much more to it than that. So God forgives us to honor us. Well, let me give you the second observation. Here's number two on your outline there. Our certain, not uncertain, but our certain future gives us hope to our uncertain present. Our certain future gives hope to our uncertain present. The, the assurance of our future gives us hope in an uncertain present. And certainly the present that we live in right now is uncertain. It is incredibly uncertain. More uncertain than I think any other time in my life. I've never known more uncertain times in my lifetime than right now. And, and not lived, I've lived long enough, as most of you have. I've lived long enough to have seen some pretty incredible things in life. But nothing as uncertain as this. Um, I mean, our president, for example... It, 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 I mean, no matter how much money our government continues to pump into our economy, things continue to decline economically. In, uh, inflation is just continuing to go up. Our president has allowed our borders to be overrun by our enemies. Our president has now used the judicial system as a way to persecute his political rivals. Our borders have been invaded and overrun with thousands upon thousands of illegal aliens, and every day now many of them are carrying all kinds of diseases, many who are criminals and terrorists themselves, and our government does absolutely nothing about it, and we don't know why. We really don't know why. Our veterans are being pushed aside and neglected by our government in favor of the illegal aliens, but we've got veterans living on the streets, we've got illegal aliens being put up in five-star hotels. And they treat them as if they don't matter anymore, and we don't know why. We don't know why Americans were left to die by our government after the capture, after they were captured by Hamas, and our government has done nothing, absolutely nothing really, to recover those prisoners. We don't know why the judicial system is targeting only certain Americans for political purposes while allowing others to blatantly break the law. We don't know why our court system continues to rule against the will of the people, and they do. I think the truth is we're living in very uncertain times, and yet in the midst of a very uncertain present, you and I as Christians, we have enormous hope because of our certain and sure future. Amen. And that's exactly why Paul said what he said in his next verse on your outline in Romans 8, 18. Paul said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Amen. There's incredible glory coming. Incredible things coming. Wonderful things coming. Godly things. Paul says, you're going through a trial right now. Take heart. Overcome. This is your moment to overcome. These are the things you have to overcome. The glory that's yet to be revealed in us is going to be so much greater as a result that overcoming these things is going to seem like a little thing in comparison to the glory. You know, John Newton, who, who lived in a different era, John Newton lived way back when horses and buggies and all that. John Newton... Um, lived in a different century. He gave this illustration, though. John Newton said, he said, let's suppose that someone is going to, let's just say he's, someone's going to San Antonio, Texas to receive an inheritance. And that inheritance involves gardens and food and mansions and money and everything that you could possibly want. And this man leaves his home in Georgia. So he has to travel from Georgia to San Antonio. And he starts his journey. But on his way, his carriage breaks down just one mile from San Antonio carriage breaks down. Does the man just give, uh, sit by his carriage and say, I give up, I've come this far only to have this happen so I quit? Or does he start complaining? You know, that's the problem with carriages. The wheels always come off and, and look at that horse. What a pathetic horse that is. And everybody seems to forsake me. The horse doesn't want me. The carriage breaks down on me. Life is so hard. Life really seems I might as well go home and eat worms. Is that the way he acts? Of course not. 
I'm telling you, Newton says, all we can think about is getting to that inheritance. And nothing's going to keep him from it. Even if he has to walk not only a mile, but all the way there just to get to it, he's going to get it. He won't quit even though he's in pain. He won't quit just because a storm kicks up. He won't quit because he knows that just a little bit further, he has an absolutely wonderful inheritance waiting for him. And so he won't give up. He won't give up. We won't give up as Christians. We won't quit. We won't stop. We won't give up. Paul said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. No matter what you have to overcome, with God's help, with God's strength, with God's grace, you will overcome. One way or another, you will overcome. Amen. For you and I, our inheritance and glory is just around the corner. In fact, I can tell you it's only a heartbeat away. And if the glory is still, even if it's just still several years away, that's all right. Because the truth is, time is passing very, very quickly now. Would you agree? Yeah. I, when I said it's June already, some of you it's June already, man, it's June already. Wow. Half a year's old already, 2024. But what God has done for us and what God has prepared for us is beyond anything we can imagine. Yeah. And so what we do is we keep going and we keep going, even though times are tough, because glory is just ahead. We keep fighting. We keep fighting spiritually. We keep fighting whatever. We, we keep fighting for what's right. We keep fighting the good fight of faith. We keep fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. <laughs> and I say that laughingly, but at the same time I say that because the American way really is God's way. Amen. That's what America was founded on. It was God's truth and God's principles. So yeah, truth, justice, and God's way. Amen? God's way. Poor Birdie. She died of malnutrition with over a million dollars in the bank. Listen, open your, open your lockbox now before she's away. Amen. And say, God, in light of what you've given me, Father, Abba, I'm running this race for you. Whatever it takes, this is for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's go to the Lord. My gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pause to just thank you for the teachings of your word. What an amazing passage this is, Father, as we consider it. And I've only spoken the words, but your Holy Spirit needs to reveal the deeper truths of that to each of, to each of our hearts. And I, I pray that all who are discouraged today may be encouraged by this, Father. And I pray for those who might hear this message later on via the website, Father, that, that if they've never trusted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, we pray that they would, right now, choose to believe in you and to receive you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that you would create faith in their hearts. Help them to grow in that faith. Help them to get saved but help each of us now, Father, as Christians, to continue to grow in our faith. And I pray, Lord, that you would do in each of us that which is well-pleasing in your sight. Thank you, Father, for this incredible future that is ours. But Father, we do pray, save the Republic, save our Republic, for your glory, for your honor. But we do love you. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's finish with this song. Here we go.
sun from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. We'll crown him Lord as you go forward in Jesus Christ and never give up. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here today.